There are, I think there are panels that are difficult to introduce. This is not even a panel, actually. It's a discussion. It's, I think it's the only slot in these uh, two days of, uh, of exchange that we framed as a discussion, as an exchange between two people that I think uh, each in, in their own terms and, uh, uh, of course, each in their own kind of... Uh, you know, importance have moved and shaped and transformed uh, the landscape in a, in a certain way of uh, uh, looking at, dealing with, um, and uh, interpreting uh, African-American artistic practice and African-African-American artistic practice. And it's, uh, it's really a great pleasure an honor for me to, uh, to have uh, uh, Christian Hay uh, in discussion with, uh, with someone that I consider, uh, if I want to play this very natural human African family uh, uh, tradition as a, as a father since uh, 20 years, uh, Melvin Edwards, whom uh, I met 20 years ago on Gory Island through a project and since then has continuously uh, taught me in his own informal way and indirect and directly in many different ways. So on, just for that, I thank you Melvin for being there, for having been there and being here today for this discussion which uh, we titled a little bit provocatively Breaking the Ice. So one could ask what kind of ice needed to be broken or what kind of ice did you guys break? But uh, I think that Smooth is here also to you know, get us into this discussion and he will get to that point. I just want to... Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Melvin Edwards or with Christian, I want to introduce them very briefly. Christian is a writer whose work has appeared in Freeze, The Village Voice, and Out. He has been included in several poetry anthologies, including Aloud, Voices from the New Yorkian Poets Cafe. In 1998, he opened a contemporary art gallery called The Project and worked with such artists as Homiata Zume, Buckley Hendrix, M. Green and Dragset, Ernut Mick, William Pope L., Monica Bonvicini, Tracy Rose, Julie Meretu, amongst others. He is currently working on a monograph of Moshe Kualanga for an upcoming issue of Atlantica and an essay for an upcoming Derek Adams catalog. What these very short bios that circulate don't say is that I think the project was, I didn't experience it because I was not in New York then, but uh, from all the artists that I know that I've worked with in the last 15 years who have been part of the project, uh, including Tracy Rose, particularly Julie Meretu, who was here yesterday. Uh, they all tell you how important the project was as a space beyond being a very thoughtful, a very savvy uh, contemporary art gallery in general. So please welcome Christian Hay, and I think it's a, it's a sensation to have you here. Melvin Edwards is a pioneer in history, in the history of contemporary African-American art and sculpture. Edwards' work reflects his engagement with the history of race, labor, violence, as well as with themes of African diaspora. Edwards creates sculptures by welding metal objects such as tools, knives, hooks, and machines parts to construct objects distinguished by formal simplicity and, and powerful materiality. His work has recently been included in exhibitions at the Brooklyn Museum, the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art, and MoMA's PS1. Um, yesterday, 
we started off discussing global black subjectivities. And one of the kind of the baseline that I gave throughout the different panels with 154 coming to New York was maybe to investigate, to explore, to imagine, to, you know, redefine the status of the term Africa in the term African-American. And if there is someone, one African-American artist that I know that has always defined that status, and not only define it, but perform it clearly, is Melvin Edwards. Uh, not only through his work, but also physically, by living in Senegal, and, and, uh, and by producing work that really uh, make the bridges between the two. I was talking to, to Christian just, just before, and he was telling me that, you know, between African American, there is a whole ocean. So we have to think of a way to navigate this ocean back and forth and find uh, the common threads. I'm very happy to introduce the moderator. I don't know how to, it's smooth or it's ugu chuku or it's chuku, it's just smooth. I think it's easier, whatever it's smoother. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to introduce Smooth Nzewi, who has accepted our invitation to moderate actually two series of talks, uh, two, two talks this afternoon. Smooth is curator of African art at Dartmouth's Hood Museum of Art. He holds a PhD in art history from Emory University. He's recipient of several academic fellowships, scholarships, and artists awards, including a Rockefeller Foundation Grant Award. He has curated major exhibitions in Nigeria, South Africa, the United States, and most recently at the Dakar Biennial, of which he was one of the three curators of the last edition in 2014. As a practicing artist, he has exhibited widely and participated in numerous international artist residencies and workshops, and his writings have appeared in journals and magazines, including African Arts, World Art, Kunst Forum, International, and Savvy Contemporary. Please welcome Smooth. I am really very excited to this conversation, and uh, please just start. Thank you. So I guess I start as the, the moderator. All right. Um, thank you so much, Koyo. Uh, thank you so much, Gabriella. I mean, we've been having this exchange uh, in the last uh, few weeks uh, leading up to uh, the, the actual fair. And when Koyo told me that I was going to be speaking with Melvin, who I adore, um, we've had a series of conversation, interesting conversation. I think Koyo actually captures, I mean, when you think about African the African and the Af and African American. I don't think anyone really sums that up, uh, like Melvin Edwards, who straddle two continents in very, very interesting ways. Um, I've never met Christian before, but I've heard about. I mean, like I say, back in, in Nigeria, your your legend precedes you. So I've heard so much about um, what you did with the project, um, the project, the projectile, <laughs> the HB Christian Hayes, you know. And you have such a fascinating um, history. I mean, first, you, you, you broke the convention. You broke the ice by dropping out of college to really pursue uh, your dreams. And you made something out of um, that dream. So we'll, I want us to, uh, the way we're going to start is um, I'll give uh, Melvin and Christian uh, about seven, seven to eight minutes uh, each to really flesh out um, the individual practice because it's very important to understand um, what they've done because no one can talk better about what, what they've done uh, uh, more than they, uh, themselves. After which uh, we really get to the meat of uh, the conversation which uh, Koya wants us to talk about which is really breaking the ice. Um, so I give it to Melvin first and for seven, eight, ten minutes and then um, Kristen. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Smooth. Um, when I first uh, met Smooth or heard of his name, I said, here's a man who has exactly the name that any number of people I grew up with would love to have had. 
because everybody that I knew at whatever they did wanted to reach the level of being smooth, you know. And that's whether they were an athlete or an intellectual or anything. Um, and in the years that, um, of my direct experience, that is going uh, to Africa, both West Africa and various other places, you see names, and I'm not picking on smooth, but rather you're seeing names that are put together and somehow the meaning or the reason for them existing is very similar to our experience and our motivations. Uh, if you grow up in the United States, uh, as I did, and I grew up in the United States, but not in a New York, Chicago, or Los Angeles, but in Houston, Texas, which was the uh, uh, legally segregated South. No, um, um, nothing unless you know a little about South Africa can tell you what it was like. Uh, and I'm not here so much to uh, point out the difficulties of that as much as the distinctions in how you develop your life. And um, the high school I went to, for instance, is the same one that my parents went to. Um, if you know who Barbara Jordan was historically in politics, same high school, um, a year or so ahead of me. If you know the name Illinois Jacket um, in relation to jazz, same high school, but my parents' generation. If you don't know the name, that means you haven't studied African musical history, meaning jazz, because it was very significant in that respect. Um, I guess um, what I'm trying to say is my actual birth in Houston, first seven years in Texas, at age seven went to Dayton, Ohio, lived five years there, went back to Texas at 12, um, and then lived there till I was 18, then went to university in Los Angeles, uh, which means, and then uh, uh, by 1967, uh, having lived in Los Angeles 11 years, I moved to New York. Um, I've lived on all three coasts of the United States. That's the East Coast, West Coast, and Gulf Coast. And there's cultural and uh, uh, physical distinctions in that. Um, I wanted to, to um, be an artist uh, all along, but up to university and through university, I was as much an athlete as that. I always liked books and uh, uh, reading and new things uh, uh, about Africa that didn't show up for most people until much later in their lives. Um, at the same time, I was, came from a very ordinary working class family. Um, and um, a mother who liked to read and who's 95 now and published her first book last October. So, you know, doing things uh, generation to generation is not new, not only in my family, but many others, whether they did things like that or not. You know, nobody, as far as I'm concerned, is what they are without their having, not having been other people who had the same capabilities. Um, the part of when I started to go to Africa comes from 1970 on a trip, Educators to Africa. We were in four countries, Ghana, um, Togo, uh, what was then Dahomey, now called the People's Republic of Benin, and Nigeria. And then in the subsequent years, I probably spent significant time in about 15 to 17 countries, uh, with significant time in Zimbabwe, and of course, in recent years, in Senegal. Um, somebody asked me, which African country did I like the best? And I said, well, if you ask a healthy man, uh, which pretty person, lady in the audience uh, is the prettiest, you can't answer that. <laughs> you know, you just, it, things work out the way they work out. And in the case of Senegal, it worked out, <laughs> you know. In terms of persons, actually, uh, my good friend, Suleiman Keita, and I, who met in the 70s, uh, said if we ever got a, a little bit of money ahead, we'd do something together. And when he moved from Gore to Dakar and built a house, and I was passing through a few years later, he suggested that there was a farm project that I might be interested in joining him in. And so the first uh, thing I got involved in was a farm project just outside of Dakar. 
um, at an, a place called Jamnyayo. In any case, uh, the short of it is, we've been, Suli and I were friends until his uh, death, and we're still afterwards, but since 1973 or four. And um, his oldest daughter is named after my late wife, Jane Cortez. So it's a real familial relationship, you know. Um, when anybody ever asked me, um, uh, as if there was a question of whether you were African, African American, it's just a matter of are you Texan or Ohioan? Are you Nigerian? Are you this? Are you that? They all mean African. All the things we've been called, uh, Negro, colored, this and that, it all meant African. It doesn't matter what the details are. It still is no way for it to, any of it to exist without Africa, you know where we live, where we grow up, what social system and all of that, I understood very early they are what you make of them. If it's one of difficulty, which is um, difficulty in various places for various reasons, um, well, mine ultimately, the, the biggest problems I have is getting the sculpture right. And um, working with steel, well, there's a history of that, uh, that everybody has if they care to mine it. Um, once uh, uh, in the end of my school years when I thought sculpture might be important because I was sure I was a hotshot painter and wasn't worried and I thought I was gonna take on the world in a very different way, but the truth is I saw a couple of people welding and while I had taken um, sculpture because it was required, um, it wasn't from a particular study of sculpture that I got interested. It really was curiosity, and um, in that sense, I'm very much self-taught. But then I think everybody teaches himself, and it's just a matter of who gives them information that might be called teacher or not. Um, I, I probably way past my seven minutes, yeah. but uh, I'm going to give some slides real quick since you. I I think this is how this works. Ah, okay. Uh, we put together a few slides. That's on the farm project and probably the largest piece I've made in Senegal, and it's now in the city of San Luis, Senegal. Um, oops, it goes that way, yeah. Okay. And, uh, yeah, well, it says Dakar. That's actually out at Denimelik Gaye, about 40 miles outside of Dakar. But uh, uh, that was uh, the house... Uh, built uh, that was to be the working place. Um, oops, that, no, it's going. I'm not in control. <laughs> Emma. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. This is the first large scale piece that I, I made, which was in, in Columbus, Ohio. And its title comes from one chosen by the community, which wanted a sculpture to commemorate that they were redeveloping the African-American section that was primary to Columbus, Ohio. And if you go there, it's there. It's about 18 feet high and um, uh, 30 feet across. This is a narrow view, but this view is closer to the kind of structure you might find in the lynch fragments. Uh, okay, we're back in Dakar. We're back there. Okay. This is a, a, a painted steel work that's called Asafo, Asafo Kra, which is uh, based on the Asafo structures that are architectural, polychrome, and both symbolic uh, for the various communities in Ghana. Painted uh, architectural and sculptural structures exist all over Africa. This looks like none of them because it wasn't, my idea has never been to imitate what I, uh, I see, but rather simply understand the concepts and develop my own. So when people say I'm influenced by various aspects of African sculpture, usually they're wrong, you know. But the general concepts, the dynamics, uh, that's where my interests are. Oops. Uh, I don't know why, but I'll try it. Ah, okay. Uh, in Jamaica, Queens, there's this uh, sculpture that's about, again, 13 feet high in stainless steel and called uh, Confirmation. 
and the reason for the title is twofold. Uh, the Social Security Act, which is the uh, structure that this is related to, uh, the building in, in Queens that belongs to the federal government, the Social Security Act and the composition of Charlie Parker called confirmation. Those are the two aspects for the reasons for the title. The Social Security Act, because it's the only law that I know since the uh, Constitution that gives a citizen of this country something for their 65 years or so of working in it. It's the only thing where they, and they think, some people seem to think that's too much and it's very little, but at least it was an effort in that direction, which I'm one of those people who think that's a socially significant way to think. Um, this one is at Morgan State University in Baltimore. However, the photograph is actually in Trenton, New Jersey at the State Museum of Trenton. And it's dedicated to Billie Holiday and the young ones of Soweto. And it's because the date on here is wrong. It says 67. It was 77 and 76 that it was made. And that was the year that the students in Soweto had their uprising and helped to change South Africa to uh, the way it is now. And because the sculpture was for a Af traditionally African-American uh, university, I thought an emphasis on a cre highly creative person, I happen to think Billie Holiday is the most uh, significant expressionist singer um, in uh, the music that developed in this country in the 20th century. And uh, she had my respect and she was, <clears throat> excuse me, Baltimore was where she was from, so it made sense. Come on. Oh, okay. Uh, oops, sorry, let me go back. Uh, in between. This was maybe, uh, it's only eight feet tall in relation to these larger public works, but it's the first one, and it's at Cornell University, and it's called Homage to My Father and the Spirit, and the step triangle structure does come from the idea of the step pyramid in Egypt at Saqqara. Double circles, which here is all brown and one of the circles is bent. They're supposed to be two yellow and two silver, but um, Mr. Brown, who was in charge of the place, got tired of the graffiti and painted it all brown. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, a truck hit it, and so one of the circles is warped, and that's the reality of life with public art. <laughs> uh, aside from the puppies. <laughs> See, I, I don't know, am I? Okay. Uh, well, since I'm using up too much time, I'm gonna just jump to these. Um, the Southern Sunrise is at Winston-Salem, North Carolina and a part of the university there. Um, that's the figure of the sculpture on the left. The Southern Sunrise title is, people think it because it's in a southern state, that's what it's about. The truth is the larger circle on the left, that, that part faces south, southeast, meaning it faces Africa. And, and so every morning the sun comes up and that's why it's that way. In other words, juxtaposition and, and use of direction placement or site relationships, uh, which are peculiar to whatever I'm thinking about, is a part of what I do. The one on the right, education is an open book, kind of commemorated for myself the fact that I taught at Rutgers for 30 years, and uh, the title, education is an open book, uh, is subtitled, if you can get them to open it, meaning the students. Um, <laughs> the um, upper structure, which is in open book page form, um, in the middle of the day, the sun will hit it in such an angle that one of the two pages is uh, extra brilliant and uh, reflects. And you can only see that from that view if you're coming from the library. So uh, I'll stop here. All right. <laughs> okay. So um, thank you. So I'm going to do things a little bit differently now. Uh, so, um, so I understand. I mean, Koi, what Koi wants us to do is really to look at the uh, sort of the historical uh, genealogy of um, sort of um, 
black ownership of uh, the museum space or the, uh, the gallery space. And so she begins with um, the pioneering role of, um, of uh, um, what's it called again? Just above Maytown Gallery. So I'm wondering if the gallery uh, by Linda actually served as, um, as an inspiration for what you did uh, um, nearly 20 odd years later. Yeah, I, um, I mean, first of all, I want to say that, you know, um, I would much rather listen to Melvin than myself. <laughs> and so I you know, want to um, like first state that um, when you were introducing me before, you mentioned that you know, I dropped out of NYU. And um, I don't know whether I just dropped out or phased out, because um, what I did, um, I was you know, in my dorm looking at the village voice of things to do. And, um, um, I saw something that stopped me in my tracks. Um, you know, the ten-minute walk away the coming weekend would be um, Amiri Baraka at the New Rican Poets Cafe, mm. and that kind of was what phased me out of you know sort of the institution. Mm. And um, I just want to say that um, the only other person who would have done that would have been Jane Cortez. And um, yeah. um, I mean, just literally yesterday, I was listening to Everywhere Drums and um, mm. you know Adupwe, Nicholas mm. Guillen, and um, you know, these, um, there's a spirit there that um, really kind of just moved me away and I guess, you know, not only do I not like listening to myself, I don't like thinking about what it is, what I do, and so on and so forth, but in, um, you know, after decades of doing something, you're kind of forced into that space. Um, and I guess one of the things that I've always been distrustful of is institutionalism and power. Okay. And so, um, you know, and those two voices in particular were voices that, um, you know, were the engine um, of that kind of um, drive. Um, um, both, you know, very different poets, but, you know, in a similar context, in a similar frame. Um, I got started in the art world um, by accident. Um, I was at the New York Poets Cafe. David Hammonds was having his um, celebration um, for his PS1 exhibition, and that's where he had um, the party at the time I was living. Um, in the brownstone of Steve Cannon, mm. um, and he started this magazine called The Gathering of the Tribes. Mm. Um, that led to a job at um, David's Gallery, uh, mm. at the time Jack Tilton. Mm. Um, and then I, that's kind of, um, well, I always had a fascination for art. Um, that was kind of when I was kind of struck by the art world in and of okay. itself. And I think, you know, um, lots of poets have um, admiration and sort of um, interest in every form of expression. Um, and I think that that's, um, you know, in particular Jane, you know, with her way of combining poetry with jazz, with um, activism, kind of, you know, that's to me embodied what a poet meant and was supposed to do. Um, working um, in a commercial art gallery, and then uh, from there I started writing for um, a magazine which was just starting called Freeze. Um, and I was uh, kind of, um, struck by the art world. I mean, one of the things as a poet that I always loved about art is that, you know, as a poet, you try to say things, you know, six different ways in, in a couple of words. And then and what a successful piece of art does is say things a thousand times in a minute, in a second, and it keeps on doing that. And so there's always kind of a, a jealousy of, of the way that, uh, you know, a poet, it's what a poet struggles to do, which an artist seems to do so easily. Um, but um, the art world um, at the time, um, the, the exhibition that struck me um, the most was the Decade Show, um, which took place between three different institutions, um, the um, Museum of Contemporary Hispanic Art, the Studio Museum, and the New Museum. And um, this show um, just kind of rocked my world in a similar way that the 93 Whitney Biennial did, um, and kind of showed me what um, art could do, what art could be, um, and what always bothered me is that why wasn't it? Um, so what, you know, and so um, my mother worked for Lufthansa Airlines and so um, I was able to go anywhere in the world as long as somebody had a couch for me for 20 bucks because that's the way, you know, um, especially, you know, European mega companies took care of their employees at the time, which um, unfortunately is also a time that has passed. Um, 
And so um, when I was starting writing for Freeze, I was, um, you know, I covered, in one article, I covered the, Quanju, the first Quanju Biennale, I'm sorry, the, the second Quanju Biennale, the second Johannesburg um, Biennale, and the Istanbul Biennale, all in just one piece. And um, so I'd fly around the world, like, you know, just writing about um, various exhibitions, always come back to New York and say um, to various galleries that I was interacting with, hey, what about exhibiting this person, what about exhibiting that person, so on and so forth. And the lack of um, diversity in the art world, to me, um, you know, wasn't um, a problem as much of a larger symptom of, you know, just the way things were at the time. And so eventually, um, you know, one of the galleries that I was talking to was just like, if you know what you're doing, why don't you just open up your own space? Why do you keep on telling us how to do things? And so eight months later, I was open. And that's kind of how um, I started the, um, the gallery. And one of the reasons why I did a commercial space as opposed to a nonprofit space was that um, I didn't want to explain what I was doing. And that's the problem with a nonprofit and in the nonprofit arena that you always have to explain yourself. And the reason why the gallery is called the project is because I didn't want to explain myself. I wanted it to explain itself to me. And I wanted to, I had various things that I was interested in. And I didn't know what they meant. I just knew that I was interested and I wanted to put them together, bring the audience together. And um, yeah, so that's kind of where things began. So, um, yes. yeah. So we've established that um, just above Midtown was, was not a catalyst for, for a practice. Um, just above Midtown was kind of, um, <laughs> it, was, it was a psychic shadow. Because yeah. um, there's Steve Cannon, um, who um, has, he was a professor, he's, was professor at Maker Evers College. Mm -hmm. um, you'd bring this up all the time, friends mm -hmm. with um, uh, Ken Kelleba House, which was around the corner, which mm -hmm. is also, and so um, uh, also um, um, David Hammond's benefactor um, mm -hmm. um, was also a big benefactor mm -hmm. of, of Linda Space, Just for Midtown. So I'd always heard about Just for Midtown, mm -hmm. but I'd never, you know, it was. But it, it's just occupied a time. very important uh, space culturally and socially and Absolutely. Socially politically. Absolutely. And Melvin, I know you, you actually. Uh, you were commissioned by Linda to, to do a project. Can you talk about that, that relationship? Well, um, she didn't commission me, but what she did was... Okay. Uh, no, no, it's, it's okay. It's a natural. Mm. Um, she asked me for a set of slides because she was uh, uh, giving recommendations to uh, Mount Vernon Plaza in Columbus, Ohio mm. for a, a project that they might do. Mm. And what turned out was then I was uh, in a pool of 200 artists uh, who the National Endowment uh, um, used their selection processes and they um, took it down to five uh, sculptors. Mm -hmm. And um, then we were each asked to make a presentation to Mount Vernon Plaza. Mm -hmm. And then mine got selected out of the five mm -hmm. uh, for that. But Linda was the person who first made them aware of my work. Okay, and so that was that relationship. Otherwise, in relation to Jam Gallery, I didn't have much relationship. I mean, I knew things were going on and would see exhibitions. Linda also produced um, a book that uh, uh, cataloged, to some extent, contemporary African-American uh, art. And in that, she uh, used a reproduction of one of my painted pieces called In Tri Tri, which was... Uh, it's uh, a play on the fact that the forms were triangular and that there were three of them. And uh, I put the N in front just because it would look like an African word. And so it's mm, try, try. Because <laughs> uh, I like to make connections like that. But um, from time to time, you know, I, I knew and had conversations with the artists. Okay. The, uh, my experience with galleries is a little different in that. Um, I was 26 years old when I had my first one-man show, which was a museum show, not a gallery show. Mm -hmm. I was over 50 before I had a gallery show. So, um, and that just speaks to mm -hmm. the predicament of African Americans in relation to the um, art world in the United States, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the museums were better, I got better critical attention, which mm -hmm. meant you didn't make a nickel. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally you got a grant or something like that. Mm -hmm. But people like uh, Linda Bryant, Sinke uh, Gallery, mm -hmm. various uh, um, organizations that were about our culture, mm -hmm. uh, each one contributed something, you know. Mm -hmm. 
there was Smokehouse, which was formed by William Williams, um, myself, uh, Guy Chacha, and um, uh, oh goodness, I think English was the fourth person. Mm -hmm. But in any case, we did uh, walls painted uh, in Harlem mm -hmm. uh, primarily. Williams was from Harlem. Mm -hmm. He also is the person who's responsible for the fact that the Studio Museum is called the Studio Museum mm -hmm. because it was he who uh, introduced that concept when the museum was being developed, mm -hmm. you know. So the artists have uh, been involved in a variety of ways, you know. And um, um, just above Midtown had its, you know, contributions. Mm -hmm. Sinke through Romare Bearden, Ernie mm -hmm. Critchlow, and Norman Lewis. Mm -hmm. um, and then they had the Spiral Organization. Any number of things, uh, they didn't necessarily lead to the mercantile art world in terms of galleries, mm -hmm. but they did lead to an extension of the activities. Um, John Dowell, who's in the audience, is a, a part of that complex related to Brandywine uh, down in uh, Philadelphia. Any number of places, any number of cities, and any number of people, you know. But New York is always considered the center of the art world, but I'd say it's a good piece, but it's not all of it. Well, I mean, I, mu I must confess, I, I, I knew little about jam. And, and when I went online, of course, for, for this, I Googled. I, the only thing I found was really a five minute video clip mm -hmm. of Linda speaking. Yeah. And then she was talking about the sort of the, the, uh, the cultural milieu in the 70s when she opened uh, the space. Um, there were no, of course, we had this first panel where we had curators, uh, African American curators. Mm -hmm. And in a way, she said when she started, that was non-existent. And we can say in a way that some of the things she did, no matter how little one to, want to think about those things, sort of helped to open up the space for what, what transpired quite early on uh, today. Well, I think that um, one of the interesting things, well, I remember you know, when I first started writing for Freeze, I, would, um, I was staying on the couch in the office in London, um, in the center of London there for a while. Um, and one of the conversations I never forget um, what I was having with um, Matthew and Amanda mm -hmm. was, um, wow, the art world is, is going to expand. And we knew it at the time. You know, this mm -hmm. was the early 90s. Was before I opened a gallery, the art world mm -hmm. is going to get a lot larger. And, it, and the, the you know, signs were all there. Mm -hmm. And frankly, you know, at the beginning of the 90s, we all, you know, if you just looked around, had a conversation with people who were looking at the same thing, you realize, wait a second, the rich are getting a lot richer, and there's going to be a lot more rich people around. And that's um, um, an important, you know, that's, and that benefits, you know, and as a poet, you're like, who cares? But mm -hmm. involved in the art world, mm -hmm. that's actually a significant um, factor yeah. and a significant fact. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why I, you know, one of the many reasons why I decided to open up the gallery in Harlem um, the first being, of course, is that you go anywhere in the world and you say Harlem, people will have an idea of what you're talking exactly. about. And that's kind of what I wanted to um, imprint on the program that I was bringing to mm -hmm. the gallery. Mm -hmm. But second of all was, of course, the Studio Museum. Mm -hmm. And um, the most, to me, um, sort of radical and powerful fact of the Studio Museum is right there in its name, is the fact that it is a Studio Museum, that mm -hmm. it is started by artists. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there are various levels of power within the art world, and mm -hmm. as a critic, you realize that you're on the bottom rung mm -hmm. <laughs> of those various stacks of powers. There's, mm -hmm. you know, collectors, curators, you know, everybody's above a critic mm -hmm. in the art world, which, you know, is fine, it's what it is. Um, and the Studio Museum, as started by artists, is kind of, you know, that's such a radical, you know, it might not even have seemed radical, you know, things that you do that are radical, mm -hmm. um, that look radical actually in the future mm -hmm. at the time are usually just necessary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just, and you just do things because of the necessity of them, not, you don't do things in anticipation of the radicality of them. Mm -hmm. And to me, um, that's also why I was just like, what the studio museum needs, and this is before Thelma arrived and so yeah. on and so forth, mm -hmm. that the studio museum needs is a commercial gallery. Yeah. And what Harlem needs is a commercial gallery, and we need to complete this kind of circuit mm. of what's kind of missing in the art world, because mm. um, a number of panels have talked about diversity within the art world, and to me, mm. diversity is not a subject, it's a practice. Mm. It's something that needs to happen mm. not in front, it needs to happen behind. Oh, yeah. And that's not something that you need to, um, you know, be a subject of, that's something you need to, you know, have as a practice. Mm. And that's not something you need to strive for, it's something you need to do. Mm. And that's it. Mm. Um, and so, so looking at the pieces of the puzzle that we're missing, mm. um, that's kind of what, you know, I, where my necessity lied. Okay. Yeah. So Melvin, you said you, um, 
in the in the 70s, you, you you had museum representation. You had the Whitney show in the early 70s, and then in the 1990s, you um you became commercialized, so to say. You know. So in terms of um what um what Kristen said about what was really happening in the early in the early in the, in the 90s, um, how would you from an artist's uh, point of view, um, how would you describe the ways in which uh, black identity, black subjectivity, has all been sort of uh, instrumentalized, you know, mm -hmm. to serve a purpose in the marketplace? How would you relate that to your own, your own cooptation, so to say, in the, in the 1990s? Well, my notion of what an artist produces, mm -hmm. uh, uh, especially in the Western world mm. and the places influenced by the Western world, mm. it's basically an independent individual enterprise. Mm -hmm. Unless the artist really wants, uh, first of all, to be a part of commerce. Mm. In my case, I'll be frank with you, I, I like to make art from when I was a kid and I kept on anyway and if people bought something or liked it or not, I really didn't care. Mm. Uh, that's, uh, I'm still that way. Um, uh, I'm going to make sculpture whether anybody buys it or not. Mm -hmm. That they do, I don't mean that I'm unhappy. <laughs> 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 no, that's fine, but, um, but uh, it's just what I like to do. It's what I do with my mm -hmm. time and mm -hmm. my life. Mm -hmm. And um, um, in the period I was a teacher, that was one thing I tried to explain was that mm -hmm. if you're going to do this stuff a long time, you had better like what you're doing because mm -hmm. it's, it's your life that you're using up, you mm -hmm. know. And so, uh, and my wife, Jane Cortez, was the same way about r being creative as a writer. You, you get up at six in the morning and you're writing, you know. Mm -hmm. And I get up in the morning and drive 25 miles to New Jersey to make the art. Mm -hmm. But one sort of separate but connected part for me in 1970, when I went to Africa for the first time, I encountered a man named Demas Nwoko in Nigeria, who we would call a Renaissance man, meaning he had multiple abilities, both in his own talents and the idea of developing things. And he developed a complex called New Culture Studios. And we met right at the time he was doing his first major uh, project. And um, we met and we took to each other, and I came back two years in a row afterwards, and he sort of involved me in their activities. And they were about, since it was Africa newly independent, meaning the first 10 or 12 years of independence after 1960, um, the idea that you develop things that uh, are relevant to your own history, approaches, plural, to civilization, uh, which means uh, you could do th not just things that have to do with the past, because all people have a past, a present, and a future. So inventing things that are new that nobody's familiar with um, as an African idea is natural in human terms. Civilizations have always developed that way. Men like Nwoko were absolutely, in the group around him, were absolutely aware of that kind of stuff. Just the idea of, well, white people don't involve us in their galleries and in their business and stuff, that's a, a, a normal integrationist notion. But much more important is what are we going to do with our lives ourselves? And if that doesn't inform what you're doing, you can forget it. Because that just means you want to be a beggar and someone who shines somebody else's shoes. See, I like shining shoes, but I shine my own shoes, <laughs> you know. So uh, I guess uh, that there were changes that started to develop in the commercial world. No, those are welcome, you know. Um, I still see that we, uh, and when I say we, I mean the African community in the world, um, have not uh, gotten uh, as anywhere near as far as we need to get in terms of being self-supporting, mm -hmm. self-initiating, and uh, responding to what we and the rest of the world mm -hmm. does, you know. One of the results of, of my studies uh, for myself, again, was while teaching, uh, I um, innovated a course called Third World Art, and it was primarily um, uh, an introduction, not a history course, 
but a, um, a way of uh, saying to the general American student body that there's all this work in the world. In mm -hmm. fact, somebody asked me, what is third world art? And I said, well, it's most of the art in the world, really. You know. But if you open a book on the history of the world's art, mm -hmm. contemporary art in the world, 25% was missing before it even started because it didn't have China in it. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. And then the rest of the differences were there. And this is just logical if you just pay attention to what's in front of you, you know. And so I, okay. I probably went way around your question. No, 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 I think, I think, I think, I mean, you, <laughs> you, you, uh, yeah, you, you played around it, you know. But I mean, I, I think it's, a, it's a, qu a question I think you can also weigh in, you know. Um, I was wondering if your, your background, first as a writer for some of the leading art journals, sort of helped uh, to, sort of um, helped your gallery, the defunct pr project, to achieve visibility quite early on. Oh, absolutely. I mean, mm. you know, um, you can talk about the, you know, Janssen text or the part, and mm. the problem is right there. It's very, you know, it sticks you right in the face, so on and so mm. forth. And then the question, of course, is, well, you know, mm. What are you going to do about it? I could write till I'm blue in the face, but you know, at the time, also, I was like, you know, there's a real, you know, pertinent structural problem here. Mm. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't like to really, you know, um, look back except for you know research and to figure out where to go forward. Mm. But the, um, um, I mean, the art world of today is obviously very different from even the art world that I, mm. you know, mm. that I'm discussing now. And, mm. and this was 1998, and yeah. you know, now it just seems like ancient history. Mm. Um, because um, now I think, you know, um, and, you know, events, especially by events even of within the past week, mm. um, the problem is, to me, like, if I were, you know, who I was 20 years ago right now, to me, the, the thing that's staring me in the face is this idea of professionalization. Okay. And uh, the art world, um, much like every form of contemporary culture, has become so incredibly professionalized, and this is not a localized issue, this is a global problem. Mm. And it's a big problem. I mean, I don't think that... Um, um, you know, it's very difficult to um, have a voice outside of this this creeping institutionalism, and that's institutionalism, professionalism, so on and so forth, and that there's a sort of specific way to go about things. And you know, I <clears throat> was here yesterday, and you know, the panel earlier today, and even in the context of you know where we are and what we're doing, there's um, this sort of um, yeah, sort of endemic professionalism about everything which I think is really crushing a lot of expression that needs to happen. So you, what, what exactly is very, what, what exactly is a problem with professionalism? Uh, I mean. Well, for example, I mean, um, I mean, you know, we're, they were discussing earlier the um, art school in, in um, California, which, um, you know, all the students, you know, dropped out okay. and so on and so forth. Yes, USC, thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, to sort of make it in today's art world as a young artist, you not only have to go to art school, you have to go to the right art school. And you know, that is a huge problem um, for, you know, that's a huge sort of, you know, who authorizes what, you know, what is hot or even what's, what you see or so on and so forth. I mean, the authorization of, you know, museums that, you know, authorize what is culture in mm. the visual arts, that's one mm. thing. But even within the market and the gallery system, mm. you know, there's this question of who is authorizing. Mm. But um, I don't think that, I think that that's an even easier question because I think it even begins way before it even gets to that point within mm. the art schools. Mm. Um, you know, and this question of, of um, you know, it's all just become much more professional even than it was 20 years ago. Okay, um, I still want to hit him hard, yeah. So my next question really is, I mean, <laughs> you're, you're, I mean, I still want to go back because you're, 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 the project was very, very seminal. It was very important. Mm -hmm. And so um, some of the artists you work with in the, in, uh, in the project are very successful artists today. Mm -hmm. So, and they were successful when they were with you. Mm -hmm. So if professionalism is the, is the key into the art world today, why were you successful with the artists in the very beginning? What was different at that time? Um, I mean, you know, there's lots of things you can do with the power of naivete. Okay. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, being naive is, is so incredibly powerful. When you know things, that's when you start to become weaker. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, at the time, you know, you put together something and you're just asking various questions. And, mm. you know, it's the opportunity to ask questions in mm -hmm. actions as opposed to just in, you know, words or thoughts is, is mm -hmm. you know, really extraordinary. Um, but, you know, and I mean, um, I, one of the, the 
you know, sort of bizarre and disappointing things that, um, you know, if you Google me, the first thing that pops up is um, this lawsuit that the was between, suit, yeah. you know, um, don't want to go there. Yeah, you know, the Swiss billionaire. I don't know, you know, <laughs> the Swiss billionaire over, Ju you know, Julie's work, mm. um, and um, which is unfortunate only because you know it sort of you know you have to go through several pages before you find out some of the other things, mm. um, which were to me were more interesting. But to me, that's also just a you know sort of indicative of the sort of. Um, seriousness of the visual arts being mm. a sort of um, domain of mm. the ruling class to, mm. you know, present itself via, you know, usually the works of the, you know, upperly mobile class. Mm. Um, I mean, and, you know, I'm listening to Melvin talk about, you know, his sort of artistic growth, and I think it's fantastic. Mm. And it's unfortunate that I don't even think an artist today can take your path, because mm. I, don't, I don't think that that's... Um, I mean, this sort of like um, professionalism, the sort of um, market mentality, mm. it's there also. It's in Senegal now, um, which it may not have been, you know, 30 years ago. It's uh, certainly in South Africa now. I mean, where do you go to escape sort of mm. the market and mm. the art world mm. and, you know, so on and so forth and just to focus on the art as an mm. artist or as a critic? Mm. I mean, as a poet, of course, you know, it's still there. Poets are always fighting for things that happen, you know, 100 years after you die. <laughs> so, you know, part of the problem with uh, visual arts is that, you know, artists have to have, you know, it's very difficult to sort of um, not put a stake in the ground at mm. some point d during your career, whereas, mm. you know, poets can mm. sort of just imagine their lives of, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, want, I, want, yeah. I want you to weigh in, but I, I want to, um, I remember an interview, uh, Lydie and Mantia had with you where you talked about human development versus entertainment. Mm -hmm. And I think it speaks to what, I mean, the, your idea of professionalism in, in, in the art world today. So I want you to sort of flesh that out in response to, um, to uh, Christian's um, perspective. Well, there are all aspects that exist mm. and always have. Mm. Uh, the weight of one area or another. Mm. Um, it's true that, um, you know, I as a young uh, person coming through and out of art school or out of school, because uh, I like the university, because I like the library, I liked a lot of, about it. Um, and the notion of career, to the extent that it's present now, just didn't exist at all. Uh, when we say the art world, I like to say, well, that's nice, but there's no such planet, you know? And um, it's important to know that there isn't, that is, it, it's not any different when we, once it comes to the mercantile aspect mm. from anything else in the mercantile world, that is in the business world. The gallery business is uh, naturally run by people who are trying to make a profit using the uh, products of uh, people who make art. You know, we, we are the producers. Uh, the relationships and how that happens, they change a bit, but basically once it gets to the marketplace, it's everything is subject to how the marketplace works. For instance, now um, there are art magazines. In 1960 to 65, there were about three international, maybe five mm -hmm. international art magazines. And the chances of your work um, showing up in them were pretty close to zero. Mm -hmm. And um, um, uh, and even if they did show up there, it didn't mean it translated into any business. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, uh, it's very difficult for an artist, I think. When I say an artist, I mean a person trying, first of all, to be an artist. Um, um, and I think that's a personal set of choices. I've always said, and this is an, another old teacher uh, statement, you're an art student, you want to make money? Why, what are you here for? Go to Wall Street. Mm -hmm. If you work with money, you make, even if you do poorly, you weigh, make much more money than anybody who makes art. Mm -hmm. And if you are making art, you're like the person that grows grapes. Mm -hmm. You gotta do 15 things uh, and then harvest the grapes and then get them to somebody who will give you half the value mm -hmm. so that they can actually be the person who sells and makes the maximum profit. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're talking about going through five or 10 processes before the exchange uh, comes back to the artist. Well, um, anybody with common sense says, wait, I've got the thing, if I can sell it direct, 
then I get the money. But I, I'm saying that this happens now before we're even getting to that merchant, like within the art schools itself. I mean, you're a, t you're no, no, a teacher, I, 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 and the art yeah. schools now themselves yeah. have become. I'm not. A, I'm not. I wasn't putting schools space. out of it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, in other words, I'm not. See, it doesn't matter whether schools exist or all. You st uh, uh, at all. You still have the circumstance of somebody is the producer, uh, and somebody uh, is the purchaser or receptor, mm -hmm. and in between there often is a middle middle person. So with that reality, um, um, the details of how each level operates may shift around a bit, but it still means artists is at the level of producer with the responsibility of of paying for and developing it, and then the you know at the other end of it, right. some artists uh, have decided to be um, uh, very conscious of that and found ways to be more active themselves in the end of creating the value and reaping the rewards of the value, but 99% don't. Yeah. And the statistics, as I remember them, were. Three years after a graduate uh, student has graduated, 85% or more will never be an artist and never make a living or do anything in relation to what they've spent uh, 10 years studying. In other words, it's not a profession that is there like engineering or law or various other things. And if you don't recognize that from the beginning, you just are in for a lot more pain than the pain you're going to have anyway. Well, well, <laughs> well I mean, we're, we're, we're almost out. We're, al we're really out of time. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it goes so fast. Yeah. You know? um, so I wanna, I'm, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to just um, throw it to the audience because we speaking to ourselves. Um, we'll entertain one or two or three questions from the audience. And who's going to fire the first salvo? <laughs> Come on, Coco. <laughs> okay, I mean, there... yeah, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, my name is Osi, Osi Aldo. Um, yesterday, we were looking at um, the role of art when we were looking, somehow, when we were dis. Well, the panel was talking about, uh, you know, the the black subjectivities and stuff like this, and it was somehow cast in a kind of pessimist, well, pessimistic view of it. it was was um, discussed a lot, and um, I go with a lot of what uh, Melvin has talked about in terms of the career of the artist and you know the. The, the need, the internal need for the artist to create art, which, which means they follow that path of being an artist. At, at the same time, I'm, I'm curious about what Christian um, said about, um, you know, when, when he writes about art and all this, you know, the, the view of art being something that says a thousand things in, at once and continues to say it. So in, in your view, what does art actually do? Should, does it have this responsibility for social reform? Uh, or is, is that included in a bigger role? What does art do as I far mean, as you're concerned? I would concerned? love to have, have been a fly on the wall in some of the conversations that Jane and Melvin had about this. But to, for me, um, I mean, you know, as I said, as, as a poet, you're always jealous of art for being able to do that. But um, what poetry does is poetry gives itself out and you use words in a way that poets come up with that you might not even be aware that it was a poet that came up with it. But the interesting thing to me about, and it's just me, my you know, opinion about art is, um, and one of the things I love about art is that it demands you get up and go to it. Art has a very kind of, um, um, so, you know, it's one of the things that, you know, as much as we slide in JPEG and so on and so forth, it's always going to be different for the experience you have with art and, and from when you're standing one on one with it. And that sort of singular um, sort of method of transmission is, is one of the most powerful things about art that's kind of, um, you know, always understated. And so if you're 
have that singular method of transmission with something that was made a thousand or you know ten minutes ago. Um, that to me is is part of the power of it, where it's like poetry is disseminated out and to the point where you don't even know that you're accessing it. Um, but art still retains that power of having just you know that one-on-one -on -one sort of you know you standing there with an object, mm -hmm. and um, you know that hopefully <laughs> will never be taken away from the power of the medium. And so um, I don't know if that's even answering your question. I'm kind of now just yeah. I think I think it does. I think it does. Thank you. Okay. I mean, I, I can say. I mean, when you talk. About, I mean, when in, in, back to your question about professionalism. I, I don't think it's only in the arts. I mean. I mean, you have uh, MFAs in creative writing, mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah. and, and so yeah. how does that affect uh, how you read poetry? I mean, I'm asking you this. Oh, I mean, I, it's, it's frightening. I mean, absolutely. Okay. I mean, the, the, you know, we're entering into this post-capital era that, mm. you know, really needs to, you know, I think be addressed. I mean, we're here at a fair. Mm. I mean, you know, I was, I was saying earlier that, um, you know, and I've been, you know, enjoying these, these panels, you know, very much yesterday and today. Mm. Um, the two um, panels that reminded me the most of it were um, at the ICA in 90... Five, six, something like that, the Franz Fanon um, at the ICA, and the panels there, that's where I first met Steve McQueen, Isaac Julian, Lyle was involved in that show. Um, the post-black conference um, that the Studio Museum had in Los Angeles, where I got into it with Carrie James Marshall, that to me, you know, these, those sorts of exchanges were very, very, very interesting. And it's interesting to note that, that these kind of conversations now, that we're having this right now at a fair. Mm. Um, and, you know, like Franklin was saying before, this is, you know, it's the great vibe and so on and so forth, but to sort of um, acknowledge how capital has sort of informed our conversation is mm. important. I mean, you know, and this fair needs to happen because, you know, you, you, it's, it's, there's almost an even keeping up with the Joneses aspect of it because mm. thank goodness this is happening because otherwise it wouldn't be happening, you know? And, you know, that's important. Mm. But it still needs to be acknowledged where this space has gone. And I think, you know, one of the interesting things, if you're looking about articles about this here, there was something in Hyperallergic, you know, the other, the other day about the fair. And they had the, I'm sorry for my language, the fucking gall to talk about the race of the, of the exhibitors. Have you ever seen any other article about a fair <laughs> which mentions that? I mean, you know, and so these, these sort of systems still exist. And despite the fact that you're, you know, you can still play the game and still be crushed by the system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, this is that's professionalism to me. Yeah. Okay. I, I just had a question. Um, as a, a younger person who's involved with uh, supporting the arts and as trying to collect it and being a philanthropist, my question is, um, Mr. Edwards spoke about our community being self-sufficient, and I guess this question is more for Christian. How do you, as a, um, a gallery owner, uh, what suggestion do you have or the, the task of convincing uh, our community, especially persons in my generation, to take the step to support this community, specifically financially, with actually purchasing art? Um, because I think there's a, you know, a long time, I guess, we're now in a fi different financial place. I mean, there is some level of success where we do have excess or spendable money, but to convince a person to spend whatever, a thousand, two thousand dollars on a piece of art versus other things that are disposable seems to be a very difficult task. And I'm just wondering what are your thoughts about how to get us to take that step? That's yours. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, hmm. I, you know, I always believed in art to, to the um, extent that the work demands what it gets, and so the work will find certainly its way. And sort of the, you know, to me, I was more of a, you know, the rudder rather than the the engine because the work was always the engine, and. Um, um, the the best thing to do actually is to subvert the system by going directly to artists, and this is the worst thing a gallery could ever tell you. But um, um, the artist, um, like working with the artist, is actually I think for you know the the best way. And and you know an artist will tell you go to my gallery. An artist will tell you okay here I got something for you so on and so forth. And you know that speaks to you know what the art, where the artist sees themselves in the system. But because there's um, I mean, you know, the 
you know, um, you know, works of Julie are seven figures, for example. Um, the number of you know um, black collectors who are going to end up getting her work just because of that is going to be you know significantly small, if any. I mean, uh, you know, um, you know, if you have you know the richest people in the world fighting for that work, if you want to talk about like to even say Kehinde Wiley, like if you're trying to get a Kehinde Wiley and an original, not a print, or so on and so forth, you know, it's like well, okay, after Kanye and Jay Z and you know the Empire set have bought theirs, what's you know what's going to be left for you? And of course, that's what you know a lot of the people are going to be driven towards. If you're you know um, you know whatever it is that you're trying to do. It's it's and if you're trying to use your your capital to you know make a statement and make a support and and support a system, um, I don't think that the system exists in the way that it should right now. And so you know and that's you know I'm not a part of that system anymore, thank goodness. But the um, you know d just put the support directly to the artist is what I'd say. So if you see see a work that you like, if you and you can't get it through any other means. And if you know artists in your community, go right, you know, go right to them and ask that question and talk about if you see an artist whose work you like, get to know them and put, the, put in the support that way. So, the, my advice is pretty much the same. Excuse me. <clears throat> the same, um, um, you know, somewhere in there is the right place for how much money someone has how much money an artist uh, needs for his work, um, um, and the, the stage of life. You just can't, oh, I'll give a quick little story. It, it does involve my family, the Studio Museum, uh, because I was on their board for 20 years. And early on in the early 80s, um, they were uh, sending groups to visit artist studios, and they decided to visit mine uh, which I wanted and agreed to. And being a relatively nice guy, uh, there were about a dozen people that came in a van. And I said, well, since you're all a part of the uh, board of the Studio Museum and your friends and we're trying to grow something, um, this group of works of mine, uh, uh, anybody who wants one can have one for $600. And um, nobody. Nobody. They weren't going for that much, uh, uh, you know, maybe $5,000 each at the time, but I literally said that. I was just trying to encourage our community to get involved, and nobody took me up on it, you know. I can't hear you. That's the point I'm more referring to, that when even art seems to be inexpensive, and that word is such a relative word, but I'm getting to the point of uh, getting people to take that step to understand the cultural importance of supporting this and doing it. They were, even, they were wearing uh, $150 shoes. Absolutely. That's, you know, that's what I'm pointing to. And, and the thing is, you it's know. like, you know, you, you don't have to get other people. I, literally, I mean, that story would have changed had there been one person. You wouldn't have heard that story. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so it's it's um, yeah. it's by example. Um, it's you know by and if you you know have enough energy and bite, you you know it will come to you to figure it out. But it's certainly yeah. you know you have to walk the walk. Yeah, I but mean, one of the differences now is simply publicity. You know, in other words, people now can read that the art of uh, various African peoples um, sold for this, that, and the other, and it's, you know, it's far beyond an amount like that. Uh, so <laughs> I told the same story recently, and somebody said, I'll take 20 of them. I said, well, you're about 30 years too late, you know, but <laughs> so if you want to work out the interest, you know. But I guess, um, you know, we have to face the reality that we're a, a beginning and learning community in relation to all of this. We really are. And that's in every level of the profession, from artists to dealer to curators to administrators, you know, to writers. We're really at a beginning level. And while there may be individuals that are beyond that, the truth is beginners, it takes time. The art world now is not what it was anyway in 1960 for anybody, you know. 
uh, in Japan, China. China wasn't, there was no China 20 years ago, you know, art-wise, art world-wise. There was 2,000 years ago. Of course, there was, there was, I got reminded of that, that there was one 10,000 years ago, exactly. you know, because they've been through every ism that already was and is, but the point is, is that um, in relation to this contemporary world that we're talking about, you know, the last century or so, um, that's been a Western phenomena that's developed, you know, and you have to pay attention to the whole history, not just our own recent circumstance and our own recent participation in it. In other words, we need to do some homework, you know, and it'll help us. I don't say it'll solve anything, but it certainly will help us. Well, uh, well, excuse uh, me. We, I mean, there couldn't be a better transition. The yeah. next panel, the yeah. next discussion will be exactly about on that, gallery, you know, galleries and, you know, yeah. dealing and so on. Yeah. So please stay on to listen to uh, two very active uh, dealers. And do you want us to do it immediately? Uh, or do we have a break no, for five minutes? No, we have a break for 10, 15 10, minutes. 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Melvin. <laughs> thank you, Christina. Thank you all.